my name is Maura Keefe. I'm one of the scholars in uh, residence here at Jacob's Pillow. Welcome to Pillow Talks. The title of today's talk is Build Me a Theater. Uh, this is not my imperative. I didn't demand this from anybody. No one is building me a theater per se. Rather, this is what Jacob's Pillow founder, Ted Sean, said to the architect, Joseph Franz. Sean, Sean's command led to the construction of the first ever built expressly for dance theater in the United States. It opened in 1942. In this talk, we are gonna have a conversation, the four of us, about how the pillow performance spaces have existed, past, present, and maybe even uh, imagining a future. Some threads that I think will stitch our conversation together come from David Couto, whom I'll in, uh, introduce in a moment. Themes of sustainability, innovation, authenticity, and craft. These three folks uh, come from very different perspectives on the role of a performance space, each of whom I'm gonna introduce very briefly and then we'll get into the heart of the conversation. David Couteau is the president and principal of Flansburg Architects where he specializes in public, private, and international arts and educational institutions. You all may know him best for his design of the Perlis Studio which opened in 2017. That uh, 7,300 plus square foot space is the site of the School at Jacob's Pillow, Pillow Lab residencies and other events. Cruteau is also responsible for the gaping maw on the back of the Ted Sean <laughs> Theater right now, the redesign that's happening this summer. Next is uh, Vincent Vigil Vigilante, whom we mostly refer to as Vinny. He's the director of technical production here at the Pillow and he's been here since 2016. To those of you who spend more time in the audience than backstage, you might be less familiar with Vigilante's essential work. Simply put, he manages all theatrical productions for every single show and event the Pillow produces and presents. In addition, he is also a freelance uh, lighting designer for dance and theater. And then Norton Owen, Director of Preservation. He's been associated with the Pillow since 1976 overseeing all programs uh, concerned with dance documentation, exhibitions, archival resources. This means that the exhibition that we're seated in today, which is uh, conveniently also called Build Me a Theater, you'll notice as you glance around the walls that uh, it points out all of the performance spaces thus far, the Bacalar Studio, the Ted Sean Theater, the Doris Duke Theater, and the Henry J. Lear stage. Thanks for being here and being in this conversation. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. <laughs> so this is an unusual moment for the world at large, obviously, and as well as for Jacob's Pillow specifically. As we all know, the Doris Duke Theater was destroyed by fire in November, and in some ways, uh, that opens the possibility to imagine what makes a theater a theater. So a uh, pop quiz, I promised David there would be no pop quizzes, but here's the first one. Uh, please answer this question off the top of your head. If Ted Sean came to you today and said, build me a theater, name the two most important things. We're gonna go David, then Vinny, then Norton. Two most important things for a theater. To, to build a theater. Um, the first one is the connection between the dancers and the audience. How do you create a place where you have a really strong sense of community? That would be the first thing. And the second thing would be, um, how is that place connected to the landscape? And particularly through natural light, I'm really interested in how can theaters exist kind of almost outdoors, but indoors. So I would say those two things, a connection between dancers and audience and a connection between the audience and dancers to the landscape. Okay. Vinny, what are your two? Um, flexibility and functionality. So. Well, we're going to ask you more about those two okay. things in a moment. Okay. <laughs> and Norton, how about for you? Um, well, since they already took several of them, I would say uh, intimacy and, uh, and sense of place. That's a place. Mm -hmm. Okay, so remember what everybody said and then we'll see if they stick with that through this conversation. So Norton, the first performance space here at The Pillow was the Tea Garden and the Bacalar Studio. Um, tell us how that served as a performance space in the early days of The Pillow before the Tetron Theater was built. Well, it definitely had both intimacy and sense of place, I will say that. Um, so this was, there's a photograph of it right at the beginning of this panel over here. Um, the two barns that were pre-existing when Ted Sean came here in 1931. Um, that, and I think that was really the selling point for him of wanting to be in this spot. He had a barn that could be converted into a space for dance. So um, that, it, it, and it came out of really wanting just to have a studio. It was not purpose built as the Ted Sean Theater was as a theater. It later served that purpose 
but really uh, the original purpose of it was just as a dance studio. And so then it meets your sort of initial criteria of uh, in, you know, relationship between dancers and audience and definitely natural light, because that's the only lighting that was in there, right? There was no electricity at Jacob's Pillow uh, until the mid thirties. And so uh, yes, natural light was what they had. <laughs> So not so much flexibility for that space, but some functionality, functionality right? Yeah. Definitely. <laughs> okay. Um, so, t Norton, tell us a little bit about the conversations from that you know from letters and oral histories uh, between Joseph Franz, the architect, and Ted Sean. I mean, because it, it had to go beyond those. Build me a theater. There has to be some things that Sean wanted. One would presume, but I will say. Well, first of all, I want to say in, in talking about this that we are very privileged to have with us today uh, two daughters and a grandson of Joseph Franz. So uh, the Franz family is represented here, which we're very proud of. Um, um, and I remember um, Shirley and Joe's mother, Amelia Franz, telling me that story. Um, that she was very proud of, that the, that the instructions from Ted Sean to Joseph Franz were, build me a theater. Um, they maybe went more extensively <laughs> than those four words, but those were the, that was the beginning of it. And, uh, and I thought it made for a great title for this, mm -hmm. uh, because I think it points out how differently things were done then versus how they are done now. Mm -hmm. And certainly, uh, that also can trace itself to uh, the beginnings of Jacob's Pillow in terms of Sean even s deciding that he was going to come to this place uh, was again, you know, he did not look at a lot of different places to decide on coming here. He saw this place, saw that it had a barn. Great, I'm in. <laughs> right. and, and so Franz, before designing the, uh, the dance theater, as I'm going to sort of call attention to it. He had designed the shed at Jacobs, uh, sorry, the shed at Tanglewood. So the certainly Kus had it. Yeah, the Kusevitsky music shed at Tanglewood was very much his baby also. Um, him taking over for Saarinen, who designed a, a theater that they were not able to um, afford. Mm -hmm. um, and so it was Franz's genius to figure out a way to build a, a space that would serve the function that it still serves today. Uh, and stay within budget. So, I, I, Vinny, I've been thinking, um, most of us, when we think of that initial conversation, we think about the kind of public space where we sit in the audience, where we see the dancers on stage. Um, if you had been there kind of tapping on the shoulder of Joseph Franz when he was designing the, the, the not so uh, public space, it's not really private space, but the space that most of us don't see, maybe first tell us what's back there. What's in, what's in the wings of the Ted Sean Theater that have been there since the, the, since the 40s? Oh, um, well, everything, actually. <laughs> Not much has changed. We did, they did expand a little bit. Um, but to tap on the shoulder, I would say uh, more space. <laughs> um, it was pretty shallow, and it still was. We don't actually have much wing space in the Ted Sean. So when dancers hop off, there's a wall. Like, they're like, woohoo, and they're gone. You know, um, so... That's what I would be to talk about the most, is how many dancers are we going to have on stage? How, how are they getting to and from? So there's, there's dressing rooms. We know mm -hmm. about them. There's wing space. What other kinds of things are backstage at a theater typically that have been now put into the, that, that has been existing in there that then led to uh, the need for the um, renovation? Oh, gotcha. So, um, yeah, so right now we have dressing rooms. There's a little workshop space. There's a loading dock. Um, there's a star dressing room, there's all that kind of stuff. But when I walked in, the thing is, is that there's the peaked roof, which actually makes things quite difficult uh, to hang material from. Clearly, uh, that wasn't thought about, about all the lights that possibly would end up going in there, uh, flying things, flying people. So, so right, we're like this. So you, <coughs> we can't have a big, as the theater uh, ceiling is right now, nothing can fly in and out of the space unless it... Correct. Right. Okay. And what has been done, and, and all the people before me have always done little incremental things to try to make it work a little better. Um, the, the, can I talk about form and function? Yes, or, you know, yeah. <laughs> so, um, so, you know, one of the things that production people do, the, one of the hardest things is, is making a space do what it needs to do for an artist. You know, that's the number one thing we're trying to do is accomplish a goal. 
of creation. So a choreographer has a vision, maybe working with a scenic designer or a lighting designer, and then you think, oh, I wonder how that's going to work in this space. In this space. Mm -hmm. So, and that's every theater. Every theater has its quirks, and our job is to figure out how to make it work. Or if a piece was created in, say, another space, and it comes to our space, and it doesn't really fit, how do we maintain that integrity? Um, so. With the Sean, you know, it was built for what it was back in the time, at the time, but everyone, like I said before me, has done something to increase the functionality a little bit better, make it a little safer for those working, a little easier for the dancers to uh, do what they are going to do for people to create uh, those works. So do you think that because it was the first space created for dance specifically that Franz hadn't really thought about those things, or do you think it was a, the moment in time when the theater was designed that those demands weren't even part of the conversation? Oh, I think it totally is a moment in time. I mean, the pillow is great to look at the history of all the little pieces that get put on. Um, I, I love that David Chapman is here. Uh, his addition to the Sean was a catwalk so that you could uh, easily focus lights on that stuff. And it's those moments where you're like, what is the need? You figure it out. So what they were probably thinking in the past was how we do what we do for dance mm -hmm. at that time. So uh, speaking of backstage, tell us about the ghost light and the function of that. Oh, uh, ghost lights are mainly so that when you walk into a theater that you can get from one side to the other <laughs> without, or get to the light switch to turn the rest of the stuff on. Um, but yeah, this ghost light's been around for quite a while. So in, in every theater, and but I mean, you, but you're talking about the functionality. There's I know. Also, there's also a little mystery of that, I would say. Oh yeah, you keep the bad spirits out of that. <laughs> <laughs> so David, tell me about some of the things that uh, you love about the Ted Sean Theater, at, you know, walking into it as uh, maybe either wearing your audience member hat or wearing your architect hat, like walking into the public space of the theater. What are the things that, um, that you love about the Ted Sean Theater? Well, I think that it is essentially a barn. And mm -hmm. one of the things that we were challenged with, it's, it's nice to listen to Norton and Vinny talk, is how do you get all of today's needs into essentially a barn without destroying the barn? And um, it's very difficult to build buildings like Ted Sean anymore that are uninsulated, where the, the wind can kind of come through it. And so um, one of our challenges was how to preserve that. Um, and that's the thing I love. That's the thing I love about the, I love about the pillow is, um, in many ways, you kind of go back to a simpler time, you know, the whole aura of the place, um, which seems essential. And I think that that kind of um, immediacy of materiality and place brings us all together because we're sharing that experience. And that's the thing that I find so striking about the Ted Sean Theater is it just it has the heritage, um, you know, it has this intimacy. So that's what I, that's what I love about the place. So what are some challenges that, you know, when, when Sean and Franz had their one forward conversation or their multiple conversations, they picked a place next to the Bacalar studio. Here's where the theater's going to go. What are some challenges of the actual sighting of where the theater is that if you could get a do over, you would wish weren't there? Vinny, maybe you have a thought about this too. I don't know. I mean, everything has rocks around here, so I don't. I don't know if we'd find a better spot than necessarily. Um. Yeah. yeah, I was going to say. I mean, I think one of the, the beautiful things about its location, um, especially considering its context at the Bacalar Studio, there, it really mm -hmm. couldn't go any other place. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, the the tradition of the tea garden, for example, and you know, the organization around the Bacalar, the connection mm -hmm. to the Bacalar to the theater, all those things make perfect sense in terms of its functionality. Um, you know, the, the, the path that goes through here was there at the time, and having the theater open onto the lawn also made tremendous mm -hmm. sense with the, with the back of house or back of the theater being, you know, to the back side. Mm -hmm. So I think um, it, seems, it seems a logical and um, perfectly appropriate location for the mm -hmm. theater mm -hmm. at the time. Yeah, and if I could speak yeah, to the, 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 the sort of um, magic of it, in a sense, I mean, one of the things that I value about the having them cheek by jowl together, the Bacalar studio and the theater, is that truly you can walk through there and see the evolution of the Pillow's performance spaces. You know, that, and that's something 
that is available certainly to visitors, um, you know, when we're giving a guided tour that we can walk them through the Bacalar studio, say this is where things first began. There are photographs in there that show what the performances were like, and then just stepping right through the doorway into, and now you're on the stage of the Ted Sean Theater, and here's what happened next. It's like being able to walk through history. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's mm -hmm. just remarkable, and of course, that is uh, an experience that is available to all of the artists who are performing in the Ted Sean Theater, that they can feel that, that they can, I mean, maybe it needs to be pointed out to them, mm -hmm. but for the most part, that's an experience that is available to them. And I think that's part of the magic of the pillow overall, and one of the things that we try to bring out to the public to have them sense that and, and recognize that. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm thinking about, um, Vinny, some of the production seasonal staff you work with or the production interns, and potentially they come from a university setting that has like the brandy newest, most high tech, whatever. And then you say, come, come see where we're working. We want it, we'll, we'll talk about what, what they're working with this summer. Mm -hmm. But in, in previous summers, can you talk a little bit about um, what it's like for people who are experiencing sort of innovation and the future to think about, oh, now I'm in this thing that doesn't necessarily instantly read that. Yeah, that happens a lot. Um, <laughs> uh, definitely uh, one of our former interns was like, is, is this like normal? <laughs> do, we, do they do this in other theaters? I'm like, more than you would <laughs> like to admit, <laughs> we'd like to admit. But yeah, it's, um, there is definitely, like I said, we, we try to make it function properly. So. Uh, and do the thing we need it to do. So, um, like, things can't fly in, so everybody's on a ladder for six to eight hours, you know, like, working up at heights and, and doing all this stuff. In school, most of it would fly in, or you'd have, uh, you know, a, a more genie lifts or, or ways to work uh, at heights that are a little bit um, safer. But the, here we have scaffolding, we have A-frame ladders, we have genie lifts, we have all of the types. And part of that is education as well. Um, because you never know when you go into a place what they're going to have and you have to be able to read the room and look at a theater and see what is safe or not safe and be able to f use the tools that you have to safely accomplish the task. But yes, it happens all the time. It's like, Really? And it's like, yep, here we go. <laughs> um, and a lot of people are afraid of heights. I mean, <laughs> a lot of people. And uh, they work through it. And we give them the time and space to, to do it and rotate people out quickly so that nobody's up there for more than two hours mm -hmm. and stuff mm -hmm. like that. So um, tell me about a show that has been, Norton, this could be for, for you or Vinny, for you or Dave, any of you, I guess I should say, um, about a show that you think has challenged uh, the capacity in fabulous ways of what the Ted Chan was imagined in 1942. Mm. I mean, because I think, I, I, I'm gonna, well, you, I'm giving you a second to think, I'll vamp for a moment. One of the things I think um, many of us don't realize is the creativity that goes into the, how are we gonna make this thing happen? And um, I'm thinking of a, a scrim that was supposed to fly out uh, in a Doug Verone piece that had to sort of do a magic drop to the ground in a, in a, a music cue that, I, that maybe it was, uh, uh, I, can't, I can't remember who was the person who figured out how to make that happen, but it was one of those things like so easy somewhere else, and yet the time of the production team is figuring out how to make it happen. So got some, got some favorites of challenges. Well, I'll tell you Go over time that we have covered the stage in rice uh, for Cloudgate. Mm -hmm. uh, we've covered the stage in dirt for John B. Uh, we've covered the stage in water for uh, Tanya Perisalas. Mm -hmm. Um, so uh, there, there have been really extreme kind of um, needs put on to the theater, and all of them we managed. Mm -hmm. And and I, all three of those uh, examples that I gave too, you can see examples of or excerpts from them on Jacob Spillow Dance Interactive on our uh, on-site uh, online portal. Mm -hmm. So do those kind of, thinking about, I'm thinking, you've got to be thinking as an architect, oh, the weight of water and some of those things. So um, can you say something about thinking about the needs that Vinny is presented with as the 
uh, technical director, how that then leads to a conversation to you, uh, between the two of you about like, what is this, what do we need to do to the Ted John yeah. to make it a this, 21st this century? This is one thing I've learned about scenic designers is that um, they immediately would think of something that you didn't think of. <laughs> <laughs> so sure. I think that the key is, and this is something we've really tried to build into the theater, is to provide a framework or, a or a, an infrastructure that designers can work off of. So we're not thinking about something specific as you might do this, or you might do that, but to give kind of a robust infrastructure mm -hmm. and to keep it as flexible as possible. Because we as architects can't, you know, think of what, you know, what an artistic designer is going to do. And, mm -hmm. and you, they have much more, like how you get water on that stage. Mm -hmm. I didn't even know that happened. But um, <laughs> yeah, so that's, that's kind of our, that's our focus. So Vinny, uh, are there some things that uh, once it became, once the, um, the possibility was becoming even more tangible that the Sean was going to be renovated and the renovation uh, is really from, I'm not sure we will t be able to tell so much from the house in a certain way. Um, so that's so the goal. <laughs> that's the goal. Why is that the goal? Uh, so that people maintain this, we're trying to maintain the feel of the Sean, uh -huh. like we don't want to lose that history and that and that feeling that people come in and it's warm, welcoming, here to see dance, right? Mm -hmm. um, but I want the artist to go on stage and be like, I can do anything, you know, mm -hmm. like, and get really excited about mm -hmm. it. Um, also, we can say, you can do anything. You, like, mm -hmm. you know, that's some of the best things is being able to say yes to an artist, mm -hmm. that yes, we can do that kind of stuff. So when building and creating the Sean, um, the, the new renovation is really about rated steel. Like it's all about the hanging of things in the Sean that is the most challenging. Uh, the one show that really pushed the limits was uh, uh, Kyle Abraham's AIM. Um, and it wasn't anything anybody could see, but we had to put uh, multiple rows of drops plus a truss with lights all in a very small area on the Sean. So a lot of weight was put in that one spot. At some point, we just heard a little, like, like just a settling, if you will, <laughs> of, of the lumber <laughs> and the wood, and we had to stop everything. This was right before the show was going to start. And we had to rechange how we did everything, that we'd actually remove a drop, take it into Bacalar. It would lie there. That's where it would live. And we'd have to change it out. So the transitions were way longer. All of that was way longer. So in building this new one, we're talking about we're going to have motorized chain motors and automation where the pipes fly in. We can hang as much as we want. Uh, you know, as our theater consultants from APF, Brad Kosicki, he's like, you can hang a truck from it. You'll be good, you know. <laughs> and so it, it's just nice to not have to think about that. Um, right now in the Sean, just to give you an idea, each pipe uh, we can hang about 500 pounds from. That's 200 pounds less than the industry standard. So, um, so if we were to use these these lights that are hanging here as an example, that would sort, I mean, this isn't what it looks like at all, but mm. lights hanging from the ceiling that would be able to be adjusted as the lighting design needed. So 500 pounds, how many instruments? Uh, not that many, yeah. but we, we, we push it to the limit, uh -huh. you know. Um, and that limit is within the safety standards. So we get, you know, we have a structural engineer and they say this is the amount that is the working or the, the load that it can take possibly because it's wood, we don't know. So we are gonna live in this really safe, safe zone. And so that's what we do. Um, in the new place, it'll be 1800 pounds per pipe that we can hang from the pipe, not including the weight of the pipe. In the Sean, I have to work with 500 pounds with the pipe and da, da, da. So it's a lot of math. So, so David, one of the <laughs> things I remember you talking about uh, in the designing of the Perla studio is that you wanted it to have the look of um, the rest of the buildings, but that, that there's as much steel in that as there is wood, and that we just don't, we aren't aware of that in sitting in that space. Well, actually, there's very little steel in the Perla Oh, there is? Oh, I thought there was, that's me. Yeah, there's I'll very little steel, and that, that is nearly entirely constructed of wood. So mm -hmm. there's, um, there's, I think, uh, four steel braces that uh -huh. make up part of the trusses uh -huh. at the, in the roof, but the rest is all entirely wood. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So and so, uh, because it didn't need to have the kind of... Uh, it didn't have the load. Yeah. It would, mm -hmm. So that is fundamentally rehearsal space mm -hmm. um, and a teaching space. It's secondarily a performance space if, you know, if, if Inside Out moves mm -hmm. in there. So um, the requirements for that were different than the requirements mm -hmm. for the, um, the Techon stage. And um, the other thing about that project is that that project is fully insulated. You know, it's, it's a modern building that needs all the, all the energy codes. Whereas the Ted Sean, um, 
it's still going to be air conditioned, so we're air conditioning it, but it's more like air conditioned, you know, when you're driving in your car and the windows open and the air conditioning's on, it's going to be kind of like that. So it's going to maintain the, the yeah. <laughs> Do you do that? Do you drive with it? I, no. <laughs> oh, I do that. It's great. You see, outside, you still got the cooler. <laughs> anyway, um, so um, so as you were saying, the inspiration for the Perlis was the Ted Sean, but there we had to also comply with all the energy codes. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. In the Ted Sean, we're actually using an ice storage system uh, in order to um, allow the building to stay essentially unconditioned, so it's still going to have that authentic feel but still have the cooling. So we're storing ice over the period of a week and then using that cooling load to very efficiently, using very low wattage, to, um, to then cool the, cool the theater when there's a performance. So are there other things that are happening backstage that, we would, that we'll never see, that we should know about, just well, for our secret, our secret pleasure? Well, there's, there's one thing I'm, at which um, it even alluded to, is that we're maintaining the whole back of the existing Ted Sean Theater so that the, the iconic door and all the frame that goes around that door will still be part of the new renovation. So if you're looking from the house, you'll still be seeing the, the back of the Tetron Theater, but it's going to be about 18 feet farther back. But in addition to that, um, there is a crossover that goes under the stage. So right now, act, dancers would have to go outside and around the around around the thing which would be tough to do when the doors open it's let me just uh, say, say so a crossover is if i've gone off out that door and i need to come back on stage this way now they will not have to run out in the rain that's Shocking. right that's right <laughs> so magically the door will be open and dancers could go off here and come out mm -hmm. over there so mm -hmm. yeah. It's really exciting, actually, because yeah. we usually have to tarp tunnel system with lights and all this stuff. Other years, it was like umbrellas, so ballerinas running with umbrellas. So anything you're particularly <clears throat> excited about? So pipes, hanging stuff. What about um, roofline? Oh, yeah. So uh, it's actually going to be fully across square box, and, and that's exciting to me. Um, uh, it just makes things a lot easier, but I think... Uh, Having more stage depth, we'll be able to ha have much bigger companies. Um, the efficiency of work, the thing that nobody really talks about is like how much more efficient the production team will be able to accomplish these goals in less time. So that means we can actually work on and do bigger productions without a major budget shift. Um, it, it's that kind of those things that I'm very excited about. But the stage depth, being able to get larger companies, bigger scenery, more space off stage, nicer, larger dressing rooms, um, a wardrobe room, some, you know, the right power for industrial uh, laundry machines, <laughs> all of that stuff. Um, we do like 90 loads of laundry per week. So like, it, it's a lot of work. So those little things make life a lot easier for everyone. <laughs> so Norton, what were some of the things that, um, perhaps this is too dramatic a term, that you were terrified might change when you knew that the Sean was a about to be renovated? Were there things that you were um, really worried that in bringing it to be a 21st century theater with all of the um, technology that uh, choreographers and designers are working with now, we were afraid there were things that were gonna be lost? Well, the, again, the sense of place mm -hmm. that I talked about is, is something that is very important to me. And I think, it's, I think it's important to a lot of our audience, regardless of whether they name it per se, mm -hmm. um, they come into a space that feels familiar to them in some way, and that brings back memories, mm -hmm. that, that there is a kind of synergy there between place and whatever they're seeing right now that evokes memory. Mm -hmm. And of course, so to digress just a bit, I mean, that's one of the things that I feel like is when people have asked me what, uh, what's the worst part about uh, having the Doris Duke Theater burned down, it's, um, of course, there's a long list of things that are worse about that, but, but one of the things that I think is truly irreplaceable is that you no longer can be in that space to say, oh, I remember seeing Meredith Monk right there, you know, mm -hmm. or having the, 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 that magic come between space and and performance. So that was the main thing that thinking about the show on, and I was like, well, it's great that it will be better, but let's not lose that mm -hmm. ability to uh, conjure, you know, to for somebody to feel like 
what they experienced 40 years ago or 50 years ago was right here mm -hmm. and have that um, that magic happen mm -hmm. for them. Mm -hmm. And I'm happy to say that that, of course, has been something that's been uppermost in the minds, uh, you know, as we've moved forward. So I think that really will be the case. I do think that that there will be, you know, obviously you can't make volume inside without making volume outside. Um, you know, it, it's a neat trick. I've, I think I've seen it done in cartoons <laughs> where you have a, like a tiny tent that you go into and suddenly when you go inside, it's, it's huge. huge. <laughs> well, mm, can't do that. And so, you know, there will be an element to which to of the backstage um, that that will be different because it will be a boxy exterior mm -hmm. over that portion of the of the space. Mm -hmm. But I think even even there, um, David and his team have been very cognizant of that, and so that the ridge line of the theater as it is now will not be changed. Um, you know, you'll have the cupola, the cupola up above that. Uh, which again will not be changed either, and then the ridge line will also remain the same. Which means that Barton Mumal will keep his place on top of the He will still be above it all. <laughs> so I'm glad you mentioned the Duke because um, I, I will say earlier this week, Vinny and I kind of maybe bickered about the Doris Duke Studio Theater uh, or the Doris Duke Theater, or originally known as the Studio Theater. His perspective, studio that served as a theater. My perspective, one of my favorite theaters anywhere in the world where I've seen some of the best uh, dance things. So um, before I ask Vinny why he's got that point of view, Norton, tell us a little bit about the, um, what made uh, the pillow ready to have an additional space to the uh, Ted Shawn Theater in, in the late 80s? Well, I think it was, it was something that was certainly in the eye of Liz Thompson, who was our director during the 80s from the very beginning. I mean, from, from the first year when uh, her first season in 1980, when she uh, programmed Tracia Brown and Rosalind Newman into a shared bill, and people had not seen dance like that around here before, and it was very challenging. And she was really chafing at the bit and wanting to have a more intimate setting mm -hmm. for certain kinds of dance so that people would be able to experience that. And we had uh, two different summers in the 80s when we had uh, the Splash Festival, which Liz had, um, had envisioned as a sort of answer to the BAM next wave. So she figured that's next wave, we're gonna call ours Splash. <laughs> so you're just in it. Uh, um, and and the, the idea for that was we're not gonna confine performance to just the Ted Chuan Theater, which was our only inside space at that time, but uh, utilize the, all of the studios. So we used Bacalar, but also the summer studio and the St. Dennis studio as performance spaces and liked what we discovered with that because suddenly you could have people in a 50 or 60 seat space enjoying something that would not have worked in a 600 seat mm -hmm. theater. Mm -hmm. So it was having those experiences and wanting to diversify the pillows programming so that it incorporated more kinds of things. It was great <laughs> during splash festivals, we were able to uh, animate multiple spaces at the same time so that you could see something in a studio and then come out of that and go in to see something in the Ted Schoen Theater. And that really is the experience pretty much that we uh, were able to continue at a time, you know, when people were able to see something in the Duke and then see something maybe on the outdoor stage and then see something in the Ted Schoen Theater all on the same day. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Vinny, Defend your calling at a studio. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's it. I mean, once again, it's the 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 roof and the weight limit of what it can do. Mm -hmm. So, uh, for us, like the the great things about the Duke, the warmth of it, the feel that artists have when they go in there. It does. It is a studio. It's a place for creation. It's it has that. Then we're trying to, on top of that, add an entire grid of lights and all of that stuff. Once again, we're not flying anything. We have some flies uh, system in the back. Um, 
a counterweight system where you know we can get uh, stuff up and down. But once again, there is there is and was a limit uh, to the Duke on how much we could do, um, and you know the flexibility of the Duke was great in certain areas, but then there was the parts that were not flexible at all. Um, but the Duke, I'm, uh, you know, I'm going to miss the Duke Theater a lot. It uh, was the one that I could always be like, the one I can count on, you know, like, <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, but I think when you walk in and you want to do something and you have to do a, a ton of math on trying to figure out how to safely do something for an artist, it's very stressful. Mm -hmm. And so that's where it's like, mm -hmm. that's why mm -hmm. it's a studio. Okay. All right. Fine. All right. Um, <laughs> So, so this summer is a particularly unusual one um, that uh, the performances are happening on the grounds and on the Henry J. Lear stage where the Inside Out series has been presented. Um, Norton, the uh, Inside Out stage came about in the early 80s, right? And, and yeah, that was also, that also happened during Liz Thompson's tenure. And in the very beginning, I have to say very similar, I hadn't really thought about it this way until we were talking in this discussion about how the Bacalar uh, studio evolved. Similar to that, uh, the Inside Out space, the Henry J. Lear stage, began as uh, a space to have more rehearsal space. We used to teach composition in 1980, 81. We were teaching composition. Bessie Schoenberg was here teaching you know, how to make a dance and uh, to 75 students at a time. And where do 75 students make their own dances when you have three studios? Mm -hmm. um, so, we, you know, we didn't, we weren't able to really uh, solve that problem other than to add one more space. And it was by using some donated lumber and <laughs> make, pretty much awesome. just making a platform in the woods. Mm -hmm. And in, from that came, inside, came the whole Inside Out program. Mm -hmm. it, it evolved because once we had that platform and you're outdoors and like, oh, well, let's put a few railroad ties out here and so that the company who's out here working can actually show some of their work informally and you'd have, you know, 20 people out there sitting to watch that. And, and, you know, that has become um, the inside out programs that we have today. Uh, and, and really for many people, those outdoor performances have, have come to characterize what Jacob's Pillow means mm -hmm. to them. Which brings me back to you, David, thinking about um, some things that you talked about. When you were first thinking about the Perla Studio, how much were you taking in, how people were using the, the space both the performers, but also the audience. Like, did you go to see a show in the Duke? Did you just go to Inside Out and sort of see how the spaces were being used? And did that inform your design, both for the Perla Studio and thinking about the uh, renovation of the Sean stage? Well, I actually spent a week living here, uh -huh. uh, you know, with the dancers and choreographers. Mm -hmm. And um, that's one of the things that's been so fulfilling about working here is seeing performance spaces from the dancer's perspective. So many times I look at performance spaces from someone watching it. But when you see the campus and the way the dancers use it mm -hmm. and, um, and all the different types of dance that are offered here uh, in terms of how you're going to provide venues for that. Mm -hmm. um, so that was a thing that, that was a thing that really drove our thinking. A lot of it was about how are dancers going to come from, because it fundamentally was for dancers, that studio space. Um, you know, how are they going to easily come, come to it? Are there porches where they can hang out? You know, what's the kind of life of the studio. Um, the other thing that, that really struck us about uh, that project was um, the, the impact of Inside Out and kind of being in the woods. And this, this would be this other kind of, if there was a rain out Inside Out, this would become the venue. So how could a studio feel like you were kind of under the trees or in the trees? So mm -hmm. that's all one of the reasons it's made mm -hmm. out of, you know, timber with some angle <clears throat> timber and so mm -hmm. forth. But mm -hmm. uh, the challenge of the, the Tetchon is somewhat different. And that's about meeting all of if any sees, but doing it in a way where it's going to minimize the impact on that particular, that particular place, mm -hmm. and um, in some ways make less of a statement rather than more of a, of a statement mm -hmm. because it's really deferring to the to the Tetchan theater. Mm -hmm. um, Vinny, tell us a little bit about preparing the inside out, or the, the the grotto, the inside out series space, not just the stage, to prepare for this summer. 
Uh, this summer, well, uh, 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 this is a lot of work this year uh, to get ready, uh, not just the COVID, uh, you know, pandemic issues and, and getting seating, but uh, the things that happened this year that haven't in the past is we would have to run all of our cable through old conduit and, and, and have cables under the, like dig little trenches and put it down and then squirrels would chew them and you know, right before a show, and we'd have to do all this stuff. And this year we have... Uh, cables so there we can hear the, music, hear the music and so the video crew can document, can document. it. And so uh, all those things, outdoor theater is very difficult. We're always cleaning. There's things like bird poop you have to worry about, tree sap, like all those things. And, <laughs> you know, or just how do we tarp it? Uh, right now we have a tarp that's 350 pounds. Um, that so it doesn't blow away in a rainstorm, all that stuff. But this year we regraded, we got new cable lines, we have all this new stuff. Um, it's functioning better than it, it has since I've been here and it feels really great and people really notice it. Uh, we can have a better sound system, which is everything. Mm -hmm. As long as it stops raining, we can do <laughs> lots I, of I just, have to, I just have to tell you, um, so you know that people appreciate your work in uh, managing that space. Somebody came in and wanted to watch video footage of the digging out of the rocks that's there. So yeah. it was worth it. Cool. And there was a camera crew there to document <laughs> it. OK, so a challenge for that space. I just I heard a little rumor about what Elizabeth Streb is going to demand of, of that yeah. space. Maybe you'll say something about what you'll have to do from your end to um, prepare the, the inside to prepare the Henry J. Lear stage. Yeah, so, um, well, one brought in the structural engineer, I forgot his name, who actually worked on the creation of the stage, but uh, uh, the Streb company is bringing a 1,400 pound wheel, like half wheel. Um, and in order for it to work uh, well, uh, we have to reinforce the stage. So, right now, the way the timbers go, um, the wheel would sit right between those and go right through the plywood. <laughs> so uh, we are getting, we're renting steel deck, uh, which is basically reinforced platforms, and we're covering the whole stage in that, and then covering that in three quarter inch plywood. Um, and so, yeah, it, the stage can hold it, it's just the plywood can't, so we have to redo the stage. And hopefully it doesn't rain while we're loading that in, or taking it down, or doing shows. Um, <laughs> so. yeah, David is, is nodding like, oh, I'm imagining you having to think about all these things. That's and, right. Yeah, That's right. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and I, I mentioned that because um, a fabulous artist whose work is going to be here in August, and I think um, we don't necessarily think about that stuff. We, we see the magic when it works, and we don't think about uh, making the magic happen. Um, Norton, speaking about magic, um, and I was thinking about you saying, I think you were thinking about the audience perspective of going into a space and realizing, I saw Merce Cunningham on this stage. What about, uh, about dancers coming onto a space where people have danced before? Do you want to say something about that and, well, what, and how that maybe needs to be part of or has been part of the conversation with David? Yeah, I mean, I think that, that, that one of the things that dancers hear, whether they be um, participants in the school or uh, or professionals who are coming to perform, one of the things that they feel very strongly are the ghosts of those who came before them and the ability to almost literally walk in the footsteps of someone who came before. That's hugely meaningful to people. Um, and I, I will just say along those lines, I, I wanna take this opportunity to mention that we have with us today uh, Anne Hutchinson Guest, who was uh, who danced on the stage of the Ted Trom Theater in 1942, the very first season that that stage was there. <laughs> I'm sure that Anne will be celebrating her 103rd birthday come November, and um, it spins each of her summers here with us, which is extremely meaningful. Um, but I will say that, that something of that feeling also stays in the space that, that people definitely respond to um, and that we want, of course, for that to continue on, even, with, with, even when they will be on what is essentially a new Stage. I mean, I've been thinking about uh, your interest, David, in sustainability, and, and that, that maybe in architecture means you know materials you're choosing or things like that. But I wonder if you could um, 
let me another pop quiz, I guess, say something about sort of like what what about the kind of um, intangible memory of p past performances? D does that feel like something you have had to um, reckon with in thinking about how to make it brand new to function for Vinny, but also honoring the 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 um, all of those past performances in uh, the the um, touch on stage? Yeah, I mean, I think we've tried to retain as much of the theater as we could, mm -hmm. um, you know, keeping the back wall. We're also mm -hmm. going to take um, the siding and timbers and make that part of the dressing room since all the original dressing rooms are wood. So that's, we're going to try mm -hmm. to, um, you know, recreate that and mm -hmm. maybe still be able to do things like you see behind us on the new, kind of keep that tradition alive on the, on the new uh, dressing rooms. Mm -hmm. I think that one of the things that we were struck by on the, um, uh, the design of the theater was, in fact, I think it's, it's, re it's review is that the, uh, the critics said the theater is like a place with um, every, every, every nail and every piece of lumber is required. There's nothing, there's nothing beyond what's needed. And I think that we're hoping that spirit in the new theater, it's a different material in many mm -hmm. ways, but still it's all going to be there to see. And there isn't one piece of steel or, or bore that isn't required. Mm -hmm. So in some ways, I think that holding to the, um, the, the kind of essence or the, the, um, uh, I guess essence or the attitude about a place is as important as what it's mm -hmm. actually made out of. Mm -hmm. So that's that's the spirit of mm -hmm. what we're doing. It's something new. I think it's really in the spirit of like trying to create this venue where really great dance can happen. So um, so so we've kind of carried it forward in that in that way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I'm going to open it up and uh, take a couple of questions from you, and I will repeat it for everybody else. Uh, a lot of the stuff that the theater needs to do now will be not only hidden from our view in the house, but will actually be underground. Could you talk a little bit about that and maybe about some of the challenges that that is offering the building crew? Yeah. Um, well, what's happening underground is the dressing rooms. There is a, a, a costume uh, a, a wardrobe space and uh, the mechanical equipment that's going to air condition the building. So that's the and uh, new electric service that's coming into the building. Uh, so it's essentially the mechanical space and dressing spaces and that crossover that I mentioned um, it is primarily what's under the building. And then in terms of the, I mean, it's good and bad in a way. If you went under there now, you'd see some of the posts, you know, and, and foundations are, are kind of like this. So it's going to provide a really, uh, for lack of a better, strong foundation, mm -hmm. you know, for the, for the project. There's water that has to be dealt with because it's kind of built on this slope and there's it's actually built over what I think was a creek bed. Yeah. Well, so, I was uh, wondering when you were going to mention yeah. the creek bed. Yeah. 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 Definitely so, a spring uh, under there. A river runs through, through it. Runs yeah. through it. Yeah. 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 Actually does. That's right. That's right. <laughs> so so we're, we're, we're handling a bunch of, we're also handling a bunch of kind of fundamental issues with the theater by, by building the basement. So not only providing space that would have otherwise had to make be larger above grade, um, but we're also dealing with these structural and, and, and water issues that are, that are part of the theater. So David, you, you said that you really learned something about um, how the spaces operate by seeing the, uh, the artists working in them or the students working in them. And Patsy is saying that one of the things that was most um, meaningful for her after the, the Duke uh, burned down is the um, memories from the production staff. Because artists come and maybe they're here for a week one summer, or maybe they've even been here for a residency or they've had multiple years they've been here, but they're not living in the same uh, space in the same way as uh, the production staff that sees in a season potentially 20 shows in, in, in the two theaters. And is there some way that um, the information gathered from that informs thoughts about either things that you thought for the Sean or that entered the conversation or that Vinny that you might imagine would um, enter a conversation about uh, what will replace the Duke? David, yeah, why don't I mean, you I'll start? Just, and I'm then... just going to turn it over to Vinny because for the, on the production side, when we were here, when, when we spent most of our time with dancers, we spent very little time actually mm -hmm. with, with people in production. Again, because when we, we did the Pluralist, it was a, a rehearsal space. And we didn't have that opportunity, I think, when we were doing really Ted Sean to kind of have that similar experience. But I would say that we relied largely on, on and you can tell with Wendy talking, he's an incredible resource on the production here. So, so Vinny was really the, the main driver in a lot of the needs that were determined in theater. So. Yeah, I think uh, the, I think what's interesting about production is, and I talk about function a lot, but we think about the history a lot too. Like we are definitely touching every beam, every pipe, every electrical cable, every switch. Um, and everyone who's ever worked in the Sean or the Duke 
definitely has a feeling of ownership, that they are a part of it, that they've uh, worked hard, there's blood, sweat, and tears involved in everything that we try to create. Um, and so, yeah, it does, like, all of that is always in my mind <laughs> about how do we make things function a little bit better so that we can accomplish the art and use our energies in that and our ownership is about that. It's, it's, it's always a, overcoming a challenge or creating something. So, um, you know, with the Duke, uh, the amount of people who reached out were, it was pretty amazing. Um, you know, some of them would call like, do you want us to come and help sift through the, the wreckage? Do you need help doing that kind of stuff? And he's like, because I built the dressing rooms, like I, I know which wall I made. I know uh, what I did to build the loft so that our hammers hang in a certain way. <laughs> like, it's all those little things that, uh, you know, even with a new space, that's all gonna live in it. Like the, the people who are working there and have worked there and are gonna make the place function as a new space, all that's still there, all that history is there and has informed what we're trying to do so that we can just always do a better job for the artists, for the patrons, for all of that stuff. Martin, yeah. do you wanna say something about Patsy's uh, digital project regarding the Duke? Well, definitely, on the, on the wall back there next to the Doris Duke Theater sign, which I wanna say also was was the actual sign from the theater that was rescued by the firefighters on the day of the fire. Um, but there's a panel just to the right of it, which has a QR code on it, which you can scan to go to a site where you will see there's a 3D walkthrough of the Duke, fortunately made uh, before it burned, obviously, and uh, where you can, at your own whim, decide, oh, I'd like to see the backstage. You can go backstage. You can look at the display of uh, artist signatures along the wall. You can decide to go up into the booth and see what it looks like from there. And there's an opportunity for people to add their own memory so that this becomes a really living memorial, in a sense, where you can have that experience with the spaces except virtually not, and not really. So this is a question about Joseph Franz, the architect, uh, who, and, and um, who is he? Was he from around here? Norton, I'm gonna turn this over to you. Uh, did Sean talk to other people, or was it that Franz was the guy because of Tanglewood? Yeah, well, so Joseph Franz, I'll, I will first say the book recommendation mm -hmm. that Maura mentions is that Joanna Humphrey, uh, the, one of the daughters of Joe Franz uh, wrote a wonderful book about him. Uh, we have a copy in the library here. It's also available on Amazon. And um, we have had a, a pillow talk with Joe a number of years ago when the, when the book was first published to really delve into this because he was a fascinating um, individual. He lived in Stockbridge. Um, and the house that Shirley and Joe are still in today that is right behind the Stockbridge Library and a house that he designed and built. And um, one of, the, I think, the, the remarkable things about, call it serendipity or whatever, Franz was on the board of Jacob's Pillow. Um, so uh, when it came time to deciding who was going to build the theater, I think also they could just look within and say, hmm, who on the board is available <laughs> to design a theater? That narrowed it down to one person. And we are so lucky that it was done in such a way that gives us a theater that we treasure to this day that has so many uh, lasting uh, uh, wonderful characteristics about it, which we will be able to uh, take forward to the next generation. Do a promo for Warren Davis uh, talking. Yes, to and so and briefly, I will say that one of the gentlemen that worked with uh, Franz on the building of the theater, and his picture is back here among all the other workers of the theater. Warren Davis, uh, another fascinating local character who was uh, an associate of W.E.B. Du Bois. He was African-American, lived in Great Barrington, um, and uh, presumably Joseph Franz knew about Warren Davis and knew, uh, because he was in the lumber business and the timber business, knew that he was the go-to guy when he was envisioning 
this enormous span of the, the space and needing timbers that would be quite enormous. Um, so he went to Warren Davis for that and uh, Warren Davis delivered. Those timbers that are still uh, such a highlight of the Ted Chuan Theater were hand hewed by Warren Davis and we have just this year renamed our visitor center in Warren Davis's honor to honor somebody from the local community who had a lasting um, effect on Jacob's Pillow. And next Sunday, same time, same station right here, uh, we will be having a, a pillow talk uh, to explore Warren Davis's life and legacy with Bernard Drew, who is a local historian, who's written a book about uh, Warren Davis and also members of Warren Davis's family. And I gotta say, um, so remember to wear your nice suit because the photos are gonna be here when, when the photos are taken at the opening because Warren Davis looks fabulous in these pictures here. Uh, another question or comment? I just wanna say all those beams are gonna remain. <laughs> None yeah, of those are going away. I want to add to something that too. What's <laughs> interesting is that the um, is that Joseph Franz did not use the heavy timbers over the stage. Right. Like that 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 cost and kind of bravado was saved for the audience. So that that kind of structure, you know, didn't extend all the way back. And aren't we glad that he made that choice? It is, that because means... we're keeping all, all of them. Yeah. yeah. Well, and I mean, Vinny, that it has. I, I feel like there's there's a functionality in your answer. We're keeping those beams that he did, but it's also metaphoric, I guess I would say, that that feels important that um, that the beams remain. Yeah, I mean, that the thing is, is when you walk, walk into the, the Sean and you look at those beams, it's, it's pretty remarkable. Um, and, and then over the stage, they weren't there. So, like, so you know, they were trusted they had a smaller, smaller timbers, timbers yeah. put together. Um, but yeah, it, it, that feeling is really, really important to people who walk into that space. And, you know, I don't want, we don't, we want functionality, but we don't want, like Norton says, we don't want people to lose that sense. Um, it is really important, uh, you know, that you think about a space and think about all the people who walked across it, all the production people that were running across that stage, all the people that touched something or hung something or created something. Like, that's a lot of amazing history, and there's energy there, you know, uh, to keep it going. I think that is our closing remark from, from Vinny. Um, so the past, present, and future of the performance spaces here at Jacob's Pillow. So grateful to all three of you for your contributions to, to that and to you for joining us today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.